Hi, Ed. Hi, yeah. Can you hear us? I can hear you now. I clicked the right button. How's it going, Ed? Just fine, John. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. Good. Glad to hear it. How are <laughs> you doing, Jeffrey? Good. All right. I enjoyed these papers. Yeah, they were interesting, weren't they? Yeah. Did you read the Rosen paper as well? Yes. I did. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Good. I also read, um, I've read a couple of his books, actually. Okay. I think I've read, I've read three of his books. Okay. And I also read um, Lisa's novel. Oh, really? Yeah. I downloaded it, but I haven't read it. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's right now, Slaughter Dick is my priority because we were meeting on Thursday, so. That's right. <laughs> really? <laughs> Lisa. Hello. Welcome. Hello, Lisa. Okay. Can you hear us? You can hear us, okay. Yeah, yeah, I had to turn the audio on. Yeah, it's a little All right. thing to count. You, you, look, you look great. You look like a movie star. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> John, you old chum you are. <laughs> Uh, at least and I are old friends, aren't we, Lisa? We met at the, the Gebser Society um, back in September, I think. Was it or October? October, yeah. yeah. But we had a lot of uh, synchronistic oh. events because we were we all knew the same writers and we were like mm. shocked that anybody yeah. was, that we were <laughs> like Stephen Rosen, for instance. And Graham Priest. And Graham Priest, yes. Yeah. So, um, old friends in the best way, right? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think we have, um, uh, who's missing? A couple of people. I think we're waiting for Marco. And, um, I think, I think yeah, there he is. <laughs> Speak of the devil and up he pops. <laughs> Hi, Marco. Uh, <laughs> I think Doug just mentioned that he wasn't may, he may not be able to make it. Yeah. <laughs> and TJ didn't say definitively that he would be here either. Right? Okay. So I guess we, we could start on time. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that um, Lisa contacted me and gave me, gave me a, a little outline for something she would like to present. Is that correct, Lisa? Sort of summarizing the two papers that we were we were reading today? Um, yeah, just as a way to get into talking about something. But, you know, if you guys have topics that are really pressing and you want to talk about them, by all means, um, let's go there. Okay. So, so Marka, did you want to, to offer a frame or anything? No, I'm, go I'm going to leave that to you and to Lisa, but I do want to say hi to Lisa. Um, oh, yes. Very nice to meet you. And hi it's there. been wonderful to be introduced to your work and to you through your work. Uh, and I look forward to our conversation today. Me too. So um, everybody else has their name up except somebody named Akronan. So <laughs> Akronan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My okay, I'll tell you. My name is Ed. <laughs> and since that's so long and complicated to remember, I, I use a pseudonym. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lovely pseudonym. <laughs> but Gabe yeah, Sir, my, my Gabe Sir would be honored. Just, you can call me whatever you want, just don't call me late for dinner. That's my motto. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so should I just get oh, started? Can we hear uh, uh, Jeffrey? I was just just saying yeah. before you came on, Lisa, how much we enjoyed reading these things. So re really excited about this this uh, discussion. Oh, good, good. <laughs> um, so you you all know what a Klein bottle is, right? I I have here you got one, huh? an I'm Acme sorry. Klein bottle. I'm so jealous. <laughs> it's, it, it belongs to uh, to John Dotson, actually. John, do you want, 
He doesn't want to say hi. But it's and not he, a real one. Tell, tell John hello for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, say hi okay. to John. John um, yeah, so, so this is kind of an important um, piece of, of my work um, because I use it to, to signify paradox um, in that, you know, a Klein bottle, uh, unlike a, a wine bottle, which has a definite inside and outside, um, a Klein bottle has an inside that turns into its outside. And this is just basically kind of a, a projection, a three-dimensional projection of a Klein bottle, which exists in four-dimensional space. And a real Klein bottle would, wouldn't have this intersection of itself. It would flow smoothly um, through four dimensions. Um, so, uh, you can also, too, not as a static thing, as inside flowing into outside and outside flowing into inside, um, such that, you know, you couldn't really say, well, okay, here's the outside, there's the inside, it's, it's more, um, integrated, than that kind of a, a simplistic idea. But I just thought I would I, I'd start here because it's really, you know, core to much of my thinking. John has been talking about Klein bottles for many months now. <laughs> I've been quite obsessive about the, <laughs> the Klein bottles. <laughs> Never well, leave home know, without one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you are one. Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I also think, you know, it, it's yeah. Klein bottles all the way down. You know, <laughs> yeah. sort of like that old Indian. It's, it's turtles all the way down. No, I, I think it's Klein bottles. Yeah. Um, mission is what some people have likened to the the spin of an electron um you know that it 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 spins out of three dimensions and comes back when it pops back in it, the electron has the opposite spin um so that's that's kind of kleinian too um i also use it uh as as a way to get into a different type of of linguistic concept um oh um one other thing about klein bottles looking at my notes here you see you see my notes mm -hmm. <laughs> i hear you <laughs> yes <laughs> Um, it's, it's non-orientable. Um, in other words, you know, although this one, you know, you can orient it, you can sit it on a shelf. Um, a Klein bottle, really, it has no top, it has no bottom, it has no inside, it has no outside, it has kind of both. Um, hence, uh, it encourages one to be aware of one's perspective. You know, we uh, have a definite perspective uh, given that, you know, we've got two eyes all the way up here towards the top of our body. Um, we've got, you know, left and right. We've got front and back. And so we orient towards the world in a certain way, which is very perspectival. Um, and the Klein bottle uh, encourages us to look to, to one, know one's perspective, and two, um, be able to jump out of it. So uh, here, here's another thing that I'd like to talk about is, um, you know, if, if there were an ant crawling on the surface, or, you know, sometimes this works better with a Mobius strip, if you know M.C. Escher's, you know, Mobius strips with the ants crawling around them. Uh, an ant would 
would see like there's an inside and there's an outside. And from that very local perspective, he'd go, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. This a perspectival thing. I, I see a very definite perspective. There's an inside, there's an outside. It's pretty clear. I'm here. You're there. Um, well, what's the big deal? If, if you step back and look, you know, at the whole thing from a global perspective, you can see that um, the inside becomes the outside. The outside becomes the deed integral, integrated. Um, and you can see that the ant has that local perspective. And so to be able to hold those two points of view simultaneously, both be able to see something from a local perspective and be able to see it from a, a global perspective, I think is a, a quality that humans would be well served to develop, um, particularly in the current culture of divisiveness of perspectives um, where, you know, we have the liberals, you know, holding this very perspective and the conservatives holding their perspective. And, you know, right now there, there isn't a lot of this. There's a lot of, you know, that. Um, but if you can hold that, you know, okay, the liberals have this point of view, the conservatives have that point of view, and we need both. Both are necessary to function as a society. Um, and from the global perspective, I can see, you know, the importance of one and the importance of the other and the importance of, you know, mixing them in a certain way. Um, I, that, that's part of why I'm wanting to develop these ideas into language because the current way that our language works functions really well to, to keep the perspective separate. Um, we have different words, and a lot of times we assume that because we have different words, they must refer to, to different things. We don't assume that, oh, they're different words, but they actually refer to, you know, two parts of a greater whole. Um, so, so my work is trying to get us to see other ways to language these types of um, more complex interrelationships. Um, and, you know, at first I thought, well, you know, I'll just invent some new types of concepts. And so that's what I did in, in the book, um, the one that is both. And, uh, you know, I realized it was only a first step towards, you know, something much greater. Um, but I didn't really know how to get to the much greater. And um, it wasn't until reading Steve Rosen's article, um, what's the title of it? Uh, anyhow, it's it's the one I refer to in the, the Cosmos and History article. Um, and I was reading his, and he was putting forth, you know, these different uh, semiotic notions, you know, based on Klein bottles. And in the margins, I was scribbling, but what about logic? But what about semantics? But what about, you know, and, and it it started occurring to me that, you know, there's, there's such an interconnectedness of all the various subsystems of, of language that to just try to change one of them, uh, you know, wasn't really going to get very far. Um, so, so that was the impetus to write, um, my my response to Rosen article, um, and it's 
it, it's a task that I don't think any one person can do. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're evolving as humans into um, seeing our own uh, interdependence with, with everything else, with, you know, not just other uh, animals and plants, but, you know, everything else. Um, and in evolving that way, um, the, the idea of, you know, the lone genius, uh, I think is kind of going to, it's going to be our collective genius that, um, will enable us to get to where we're going. Uh, and as far as, as inventing new language, um, I'm really, I'm really quite encouraged, uh, because when I started doing my work back in, you know, the 1980s in college and graduate school, uh, I was pretty much, well, uh, here's, here's how it went. Um, I go to my, uh, advisor in graduate school and lay out, you know, this is what I want to do. And he looks at me and he says, well, I don't see what your problem with language is. It works just fine for me. <laughs> and at that moment, you know, I could see myself in the future, you know, rolling the stone up the hill, you know, okay, professor, do you get it now? And him going, oh, well, hmm, hmm, no. no, try this other approach. And rolling, you know, the stone up another face of the hill and him pushing it down. And, you know, that's kind of the way it was at the University of Chicago. And so, so I got out of there. Um, fast forward, <clears throat> you know, 20, 30 years now, and we've got uh, <clears throat> Avatar with the Navi language. We have Game of Thrones with, I don't know, there are like four different languages in Game of Thrones. We have, uh, we have, you know, entire conferences dedicated to um, <clears throat> people who like to invent languages. And right now, I see that field as, as being sort of like, um, at the level of kids playing with Lincoln logs. So, you know, if you're a kid and you're really good at building Lincoln log buildings, you might grow up to be a good architect someday. But the field of architecture, you know, isn't on your horizon as that three-year-old. Um, so I think these language constructors are kind of, you know, like the, the, the three-year-olds who don't realize or are starting to realize that, you know, they're not just building Lincoln Log buildings. They're going to need to construct an entire field of language construction um, so that the people who like to do this can do it in a coordinated, integrated way. But I think I'm kind of getting off topic here. Um, anyhow, let, let me just check in. Any thoughts, comments so far? Well, I might just yeah. add, um, uh, interject, add a couple things maybe or yeah. ask, ask a couple questions or tie a couple things together. I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing. I mean, part of what we are doing is figuring out a language to language, you know, what we intuit is possible, but don't have a language for. So uh, there's, you know, some uh, interesting paradoxes just inherent in the project. Uh, and part of what you're describing in terms of this language constructing uh, practice or activity or interest uh, or even profession insofar as 
somebody must have been paid to create those languages for, you know, for Avatar or got paid, you know, after the fact uh, for, for the work. Um, but as you point out in your paper, there are nested kind of levels of leverage, right, for really how you can change a system, mm -hmm. but also how you would construct um, a, a system. You would have to take into account the ways in which it's nested in other systems. So a language is a system of systems, but it also participates as a system in, a met in you know, other systems. And you tie those back around in your paper with the ideas of culture and paradigm being like foundational. Uh, and so if you really want to change everything that you know, falls out in the language and the concepts, the syntax, uh, and then the practices that the language organizes, the, you know, the, the, the strongest point of leverage is, is cultural, right? Yeah, it's also the hardest to change. Right. So, so then when you look at other leverage points, at these other kind of aspects or in these other aspects of, of language, and you can start to change, you can start to introduce new concepts or new words, which is what it seems a language construction is. It's a series of new concepts that point to things in a new way. But it's not necessarily... Well, I mean, I guess the question is, what is it really kind of net getting at in its usage? Uh, and so as for like where this conversation could go and the idea of um, like, how, do you, how, how does a language get made that actually gets used such that it could bring forth a world? That direction of collective genius, I think there are some good, there are some interesting intersection points uh, with other discussions that we've had. And, I would just add in that, that um, a few weeks ago, we did a talk that Ed uh, led, a couple of talks, uh, on the, uh, the Meru research into the book of Genesis. Uh, so the first line, the first words from the book of Genesis, uh, looking at the language construction that goes into that text and what it encodes at deeper layers than are apparent from the narrative interpretation that we tend to give it culturally. So, um, you know, we've also talked a little bit about, uh, well, we've read uh, the work of Ursula Le Guin, uh, for, for example, and in The Dispossessed, uh, which was one of the first book reading groups that we did, there's, uh, you know, an alternate society uh, living on another planet, which is constructing its own language or aspects of its own language to change the way that its, its world it works. And so this is an anarchist society on a planet, you, you may know this, uh, called Anaris. And one of the things that they do is um, because, because they are um, against possession, against a capitalist um, kind of mechanics, uh, mm -hmm. they, they play with the possessives in their language. And so children, as they're growing up, learn not to refer to the things as belonging to them. So you wouldn't say, I wouldn't say this is my water bottle uh, here uh, or my climb bottle uh, for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say this is the water bottle that I use. And so Le Guin portrays the educational system. She evokes it really just with a couple of brushstrokes where the, the teaching is conducted in such a way as to kind of move the mind uh, into s different ways of being. And so I think that, you know, part of what you're pointing to and part of what the Klein bottle is signifying is this sort of this completely holistic context uh, where the context is within itself. And, you know, even in this moment, we're in a, the, con the context that we're discussing. Uh, and we're enacting potentially some microcosm of collective genius, or if we could sort of sort out or find our way through that bottle or find our way through the curvatures of those bottles into uh, coherence or signification. So uh, I don't know what that, what that whole spiel, you know, that I just offered is, but I, I wanted to specifically connect the work that you're doing with other conversations that we've had uh, here in the Cosmos Cafe and also in the kind of cooperative that we're working on uh, called Cosmos, 
which is in, in a way trying to cultivate that sort of um, collective genius, but yeah. is also looking for a shape for itself. And so part of that shape is coming through these language uh, games that we're playing and these um, you know, in explorations or inquiries that we're co-conducting. And so I just really appreciate what you're, what you're bringing to it. Uh, and it really could go anywhere, but I, it, it would come, what, wherever it goes will come out of the interactions of, of all of us here. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, <laughs> to, to, uh, to hearing more. Yeah, I think it's it's exactly that kind of questioning that Ursula Le Guin, and by the way, she's one of my favorite authors. Um, and oddly enough, I haven't read The Dispossessed. Um, there's another book she wrote called Always Coming Home, where she, she creates the entire culture, their language, their music, um, their food, you know, gives recipes in the book. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I just, uh, I've been very inspired by her since I was a little kid. Um, so, I mean, the Lincoln Logs thing is, you know, a fiction, a fiction writer plays with language, plays with worlds, like, like as with Lincoln Logs. But then that has a way of seeping into reality. And that, that's, I think, the, where it gets really interesting, uh, where that, that curve becomes inside becomes outside. So, Yeah, and, you know, that's, that's the reason I wrote the novel. Um, uh, I wanted to give people... Um, okay, you know... You know, we've got mirror neurons in our head that um, basically it doesn't matter if you're imagining something or if you're seeing it, your brain reacts the same way, um, which is kind of the basis for all the visualization work out there. Um, so if we are... Um, Looking at worlds, you know, particularly like just the world we live in or the world of movies that we go to, okay, and we're getting all of this, you know, apocalyptic, the world's going to end, it's chaos, you know, kind of stuff being bombarded, you know, that's how our brain says, okay, this is, this is how the future is going to be. So I wanted to write a book that has a future that I would actually want to live into. You know, I would want to be in a world like that. If I can imagine it, then I can bring it about. And so I wanted to invent a world that I could bring about. Um, and it involved, you know, paradox and understanding how inter, you know, profoundly deeply interconnected we are not just you know like in a superficial way like hey you know we're all on the internet right now and that's connecting us um more like in the profound way that um we partake of one being and you know i'm a facet here and you're a facet but facets John, could you go get my diamond? It's in the back room. <laughs> <laughs> that like you're talking to your butler. <laughs> <laughs> well, bring, John, bring me my crown. <laughs> John's here actually because um, my my water heater is not working, and this is when the plumber said he was going to come. But it's like I can't deal with the plumber because I'm you know, happily talking with you guys. So John will deal with the plumber if and when he comes while we're talking. Um, but, but anyhow, our profound interconnectedness assumes that, you know, not as material beings, but as energy beings, you know, where everything is energy. It just manifests in different ways. Um, and so thank you. Um, so, 
you know, here's, imagine the hole looking something, you know, like this, this diamond structure. Okay. And if I'm a facet over here, you know, and John is a facet over here and Ed's a facet over here and Jeff is over here. Um, you know, we, we might think we're different facets from the consciousness that thinks in facets, okay? From a consciousness that knows our profound interconnectedness by the very fact that it's all energy and we're just energy looking different ways. Um, if you know that you're a diamond, that you, that you are the diamond, the diamond is you, all of it, not just this little facet here, that if I know, you know, as, as this is the local global perspective thing again, if I know as this facet that I am also the diamond, then looking at the world through John's facet, you know, I could meditatively go into that space and look at the world through this perspective, through John's facet perspective. And, you know, I think some um, energy type healers can, can do that. Um, we probably all have that capacity. It's just a matter of, you know, strengthening those muscles as, as a race. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. Um, I'm thinking of um, neuroatypical persons, which I consider myself to be to some extent. I think we all are to some extent. <clears throat> we all have everyday experiences that are, that are unique to us um, and that are real, but it's when we try to share that with somebody else that we have to translate uh, adequately. And that, I think, is where language is such a glorious tool, but it also uh, ensnares us frequently. Um, and I'm just thinking of an example from, um, I think it's Lakoff and Johnson. They said, um, for instance, you see a cat and a tree. And the statement you make is, the cat is behind the tree. And what we are doing with language it's a sort of distortion generalization. Um, we are, in our language game, we are projecting onto the tree our human experience of having a front and a back. So yeah. that we can say, the cat is behind the tree. And we're all hypnotized into a certain way of a perceiving cat-tree relationship, as one is behind the other. And I think that's just an example a, a very simple one, but of how um, complex this, uh, the, the kind of uh, intentions and desires that we have to find a, uh, some sort of commonality as we move from our, our private experience to our more public uh, experiences, to our politics, to our art, to our science, how we make these negotiations happen between private and public uh, is a, uh, very compelling to me. And I think it's a kind of phase space. We, we, we're not, not going to get there overnight. That would be horrible if we did. <laughs> <laughs> there would be traffic jams all over the place. You know, um, uh, you know so all of us are, uh, have, uh, I think, um, opportunities every day and every 24-hour uh, cycle as we go from, even in our waking states, we can have reveries and fantasies and make plans and change plans. Um, just as a crude example, I was going to the gym on the other side of town on my bike, and I was um, aware, I knew where I wanted to go, and I knew how to get there. I'd been there many times before, but there are about, a, I live in lower Manhattan, so there are a hundred different routes I could take, depending on the traffic, depending on my mood, depending on if I want to stop and get something before I go there. And I'm aware that I'm accessing a, a map of lower Manhattan, 
but I'm not accessing it in any way that looks like anything I would, I would get on Google, on Google Maps. It's a, it's a kind of map, uh, but it's not really anything that uh, I could show somebody else in any sort of clear way. It's, and I wouldn't need to, since it's my job to get to the other side of town the way I want to get there. But I'm just making an obvious point that we're entering into these kinds of um, liminal zones all the time in our everyday waking lives. Um, but then if we have those special occasions where we have a sacred ritual we perform or we uh, do drugs, which I never do, but I know some people do, and, or when we go to sleep at night and dream, um, we, we are, we are accessing, I think, um, maybe the fourth dimension or the, even the fifth dimension. But we do have the task, I think, of the humble task of translating that into some sort of common language that we then can share with another or a group of others. And this, I think, is the supreme challenge now uh, because of all the, all the noise in our environments. Yeah. So it's very hard for us to relax enough so we can discern what the signal is. The, the ratio between signal and noise is uh, extremely challenging now. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if I make a, make, make a few remarks. Um, um, I really interested this comment that you made, Johnny, about um, well, Lake and Johnson is inter interesting anyway because the whole idea of conceptual metaphors, I think, ties in with what you're saying, Lisa, about some language structures that map into other areas that one can think about. Um, but um, I was also thinking about um, so when I was reading the papers. Um, I didn't quite catch this idea of actually inventing a completely new language. I thought of modifying English in ways. So one of the things I thought is one would like English in its current everyday usage to be more poetic in order to get this kind of... So in a way, we're talking about re-injecting poetry into everyday in, in ways or everyday whatever language it is used that would be interesting. So that was one sort of um, thing that I was thinking about. Then you had this idea of these images that you maintain. I mean, Rosen had it also. So in his, his way of sort of describing the Klein bottle is an image that you hold in your mind as you're talking about other things in order to, to keep the idea of paradox front and center in your thinking as you're as you're talking to people and so you use this idea again in your your different iconic representations i can't remember the names of them now but uh, the spiral form and the and the embedded self similarity forms that you had were i think yeah, so this is yeah so this is a kind of an interesting idea in terms of holding a mental image as you're thinking about it. Um, the, the reference to Korzybski, Korzybski had a kind of glottal slot, stop that he wanted people to introduce into the way they talk. So a kind of a, a moment of pause before you say the verb or noun or whatever in order to remember that words aren't the things that they represent. Mm -hmm. So it, that, that's a kind of an interesting idea, um, although it was never really picked up beyond that early uh, book that he wrote. Um, anyway, so I was playing around with um, some writing based on these ideas that, that I've been so in the last few days. So <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> so kind of poetry or, or um, so I was thinking about this sort of um, um, statements and their inverses, you know, in order to tackle the kind of representation of paradox. And so um, I, I, I was, and in our other, one of our other groups on the Cosmos site, we're looking at where we have a writer's group and we're looking into the issue of revelations. And so I was thinking about the role of litany. Uh, a litany is a, you know, is a religious form of repetition um, and so I was writing a, essentially a, a litany inspired by your approach based on this idea of, of 
a statement and it's inverse. For um, what's the end? What's the goal? The telos of the this type of litany. Well, I mean, isn't it? It's typically a, a celebration of God, right? Uh, or, or that's the way it tends to be used. Uh huh. But, um, so a celebration of paradox instead. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think there's, you know, um, the the fact that we are divine and human, um, male and female. Um, animal, mineral, and vegetable. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. So, um, let me, where did my notes go? Um, oh, you know, let's come back, let's come back to Lakoff and Johnson again. Um, because I, I really, I really like their work and, um, I think there's some very important ideas in it that, um, they're helping us to see some implicit things about language that, that need to be made explicit. Um, and, and one of the things is the, the, interconnectedness of the structures of the metaphors you know the the main one that they point out is the um all the associations with you know up and good and holy and right and then on the other side there's down and bad and left and cursed and um and these things are just um, so deeply embedded in um, the way we talk that we just we make we make assumptions um, uh, uh, that structure so many of um, the things that we think and talk about. Um, you know, so, so what if, uh, instead of that left, right, up, down orientation, um, if we in, invented a language or a, a metaphorical structure that was, um, say, spherical, um, that might have an, an you know, I inner outer, or, um, you know, sort of like a, a, a spherical, you know, instead of these two eyes on the top of our head, um, you know, that that spherical, like all seeing eye at the center that can see in all directions simultaneously, you know, not, not unlike that camera on the top of the Google truck that drives by and takes all this 360. <laughs> it's, it's this type of creativity of imagining other ways of, seeing and speaking about our experience um, that I, I would just, I'd encourage everybody to do, you know, in, in whatever form. Um, if we can get them into movies, you know, um, I think that helps the, the wider culture to then be able to, um, imagine them as well and you know to the extent that we um we can collectively imagine you know think of of 
the shift from the geocentric to the heliocentric worldview. Um, you know, collectively, we, we thought of the earth as flat and um, the sun going around the earth. It took a, a real shift of imagination and perspective to ad adopt um, the heliocentric model. And I think we're in a similar worldview shift right now from going around thinking of ourselves as separate individual beings to being able to understand our little piece of the wholeness, you know, that, that we're the we're the facet and the diamond each and every one of us um and for that kind of of paradigm shift to happen i think we really do need to you know have a a shift in language too John, were you going to say something? I was going to say something, but I think Ed. Ed yeah, I, I wanted to. I wanted to jump in. Um, yeah. um, Gabe wrote a, a little paper called "The Grammatical Mirror." I don't know if any. I don't. I doubt anybody's ever read it because it hasn't been translated into English. Is is uh? It is. I guess it is in English. Is is Aaron doing that? Oh, apparently it is available. It is available in English? Yes, well, yeah. if it is, that, that, that's great. I, I wasn't aware that it is, but if, if, if Aaron's doing it, I, I, would be guessing, I would guess that he would be doing it at some point if it's already available, that's even better. But I would, I would highly recommend reading it because it addresses precisely the issues that we're talking about now. The difference is that, and, and though it was written in 1965 or so, mm -hmm. um, he went and looked at, well, where is this happening? Not, what can we do to make it happen? Because I, I personally, I'm a bit of a curmudgeon, the others will tell you, but um, I personally believe that, that we're not going to consciously, by actually sitting around talking about, well, how can we make this happen, make it happen. It's going to happen because people like you are going to write a novel or Marco's going to write a poem, or Jeffrey's going to write another one of his his novels as well. And we're actually you're you're going to do it. You're you're going to express it. You're going to you're going to make it manifest in the world. And those people who engage with that and and movies is a way to do that. Who knows which one of your movies is going to be uh, uh, novels is going to be turned into a movie, where these ideas will then be. Um, pervade further, but but I don't think that you know. Sometimes I get the impression, and I know it's not your intent, but I get the impression that oh well, we could do this from the top down. But you can. I don't think you can do anything from the top down. I think our entire history of humanity has shown that top down doesn't work. And when things actually happen, they always happen either from the bottom up or the inside out. And so. So there, there are these shifts. Uh, one of the nice things about the article, he goes through practically every part of speech and shows how it's not used like it used to be anymore. It's all it's different. It, it, the, 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 the use of the adjective, uh, I was just you know, reading through this again uh, uh, before we talked. Uh, for example, uh, Plato in philosophy has practically no adjectives, apparently. I, I don't read the Greek, so I can't verify it, but I'll take his word for it because he's a pretty smart guy. And he's been honest up until now. So he doesn't use adjectives, but when Petrarch starts talking about perspective, all of a sudden adjectives take on a very new role, and they have an entirely different relationship to the words that they describe. And those adjectives have become almost nominalized because we have a lot of expressions where we incorporate adjectives in with the noun to actually say what it is, what we're talking about. But then he goes in to show how, how poets like Rilke are using them in ways that, that actually expand that in a whole different, whole different direction and a whole different intensity, if you will. Mm -hmm. 
So when when the the, the paradigm shift or the, the the mutation to integral consciousness, if we put it in Gabesarian terms, when that takes place, our language will naturally follow. We we have to change our minds before we can change our language. And we can we can tell people all the time. I have a three-year-old here in the house. Um, I can tell him all I want to change the way he sees the world, but it doesn't help. Until he actually does, then he will behave differently. But it's it's up to him to make that to make that move, to make that shift. He has to perceive that. And so what we're actually trying to do do is to get people to is is to change their consciousness, but I don't think that you can that you can I don't, I don't, I'm going to say this not the way I mean it. Well, you can't make people change their consciousness. They, they have to realize that it's to their, somehow their benefit or to their, to their well-being or whatever it is that, that they see the world differently than they do now. And I think the most effective way to do that, personally, is not through, we have to talk about it academically, of course, because there's people like us that like to do that. But on the whole, we have to do this through art. Or we have to, because that's where culture gets changed. That's that's where culture manifests in the art. So if we don't do it artistically in the art, it's not going to happen anyhow. Though so I actually think this is the optimist in my curmudgeonry, uh, it's going to happen in spite of us. But the, what we can do is we can encourage it, and we can we can help it along. We can you know we can midwife it in some some way. If I can use a Sloterdijkian image filling perhaps, um, which I'm not want to do. <laughs> so, um, and so I, you know, I think it's, I think somehow it's the other way around, you know, from, from, I, we keep saying it, but it's what we have to do. That, that was my two cents. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think to the extent that we are becoming conscious of our consciousness I think we can do it both, not both, but multiple ways. Um, because our, our, our consciousness and there, are, there have been throughout, you know, all of history going back to, you know, um, I, I used the, the Gnostic texts from, you know, 300 BC, there, there are people who, you know, have to use an expression seen through the veils um, and have tried to communicate that in various and sundry ways, some artistic, um, you know, visually artistic, some orally artistic, some, um, you know, word artistic, um, and it it has been you know it it has happened kind of despite our trying you know sometimes you just you get hooked into that connection to whatever you want to call it source divine um and it it comes through um We're, you know, I, I also, I like the work of Barbara Marks Hubbard, who says that, you know, we're becoming co-creators with the divine now. And, you know, so to the extent that we can consciously co-create, let's do it, as well as allow the unconscious creation um, to happen in whatever way, shape, and form it happens, um, because that's you know, that's an important wellspring of creativity. Um, and they, you know, they work together. Um, the consciousness and the unconscious, you know, need to work together. If it's, if it's all just unconscious material that we, we bring up, it can, it can overwhelm us. Um, it can drive us mad. Um, so, uh, to the extent that, you know, my tapping into whatever it is I'm tapping into, I, I want to try to do this consciously so that it's not just, you know, the, 
the odd person here and there, but you know, on a on a greater scale, I can um, bring this to those who have ears to hear, so to speak. Um, and I'm really, I'm frankly thrilled to be talking to you guys knowing that you have ears to hear and <laughs> have already like traversed half of these, you know, most of these paths already anyway. Um, yes. And, and also want to encourage you to continue doing what you're doing, um, you know, for whatever reasons that you're doing it. Um, you know, this is, I, I think it's, I think it's, that's why I wanted to say, you know, we can talk about it academically and I think we have to do that too. You know, it, it's never it's never this or that or something else. It's always this and that and something else. I think one of the biggest challenges that we have um, these days is that there's no either or anymore. It's always this and that. It's always in addition to. There's always there's always more. Yeah, you got this, and there's always more. And that's one of the reasons I think we we do feel stressed all the time because we have to we have to do it in, in on a small scale in our private lives. We do it on a on, on a detached scale, let's say academically, we do it on a cre in a creative way when, when when we try to be creative. You know, it's it's all of those all together all the time, and so you know it is it's a real challenge. And I you know I I, I didn't want in any way, shape, or form to think that I was uh, trying to, to put a damper on what's going on, <laughs> you know, which can often happen, as the others will attest to. <laughs> Um, this context of um, so I don't disagree with what you said, Ed, um, but <laughs> uh, academic academic discourse is part of the culture. It, it's not separate from the culture, and so it doesn't have the same power as art. But it often artists are you know if you think about quantum mechanics and how much it has propagated into the artistic world, and most of people's understanding of of quantum mechanics has come through the arts rather than through the sciences, but it started in the sciences. Yes. And thank you for that, Jeffrey. You said exactly what I wanted to say and what's enabled to do. Thank you. And, and um, um, Lisa, you were talking about mirror neurons. Mirror neurons have almost entered the public conscious again, uh, largely through the arts, even though it began in the scientific world. So <laughs> a lot of the cognitive work is coming through now. Uh, in the world, so. Yeah. Um, can I respond? Um, I have a couple of things that I sort of want to put out there. Um, in um, Rosen's paper, he talks about the Klein bottle as being a sign of itself. A self-signifying, self-signifying, yeah. Yeah, and um, it engages three objective dimensions and realizes the concrete self-reference of the fourth dimension dimension that is encompassing our live, our lived subjectivity, a phenomenological blending of subject and object. And I find that very compelling. Um, and also, we've been talking about um, one of the first questions I think you asked in the workshop uh, that I did with you was how can we talk from integral rather than about integral? And I think when we're talking about something, we are, we are engaging in a meta per pers perspective, which is a perspective among many other kinds of perspectives, but it basically is an observer of a, a, of a system with some attitudes about that system, um, which is definitely different from an objective observer, which is the ideal of a certain kind of science. But now I think we're moving into perhaps that third order where the subject and the object is indeterminate and we are participant observers. And that's going to be a totally different kind of language game, I imagine. And I believe we're already um, engaging in that. Um, so when we talk, and I mentioned when you asked that question, coming from the integral rather than talking about the integral, I, I blurted out, well, it's like being the hole in a Klein bottle. <laughs> and and you look like this to me like you know? and i felt this um i felt the way we the royal road to get there i think is through metaphor um 
and we're going to need lots of them. And we're going to make a lot of mistakes in the process. Um, but I, I was very curious about one, uh, something that you said in your blog, um, and I'm curious about this, is um, as we move from, well, my, well, you mentioned the deficient integral and the efficient integral, and you believe that the deficient integral is um, creating conditions for us to move towards this integral. And we want to we want to help uh, the movement towards an integral, a, a, an efficient integral. I was I'm I'm sort of taking a different take on this because I think the efficient integral has that structure is already here, and that's why we're seeing the deficient mental uh, so inflamed right now. And I think the efficient deficient mental is running a lot of our big institutions, our politics, a lot of academia, uh, and our sciences are they're, they're deeply in, immersed in a deficient quantitative kind of science. But I think there are efficient uh, mental structure that we all use and we should celebrate. Um, but I think that the integral is already here and that's why the deficient mental is so inflamed. Rather than... Um, and I'm, I'm, I think that's a big research project about what could be deficient integral, since so few people, I think, have deeply integrated, embodied the integral before we could know what a, a deficient uh, version of that would be. But I would believe that if we saw lots of deficient integral, that would probably be the, 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 that there's the presence of something beyond in, integral that's starting to emerge. So. I'm a, I'm a beginner here. I'm not necessarily a historian, but I suspect, as uh, Eric Weiss said, that the integral was in the, the 13th century. There were integral thinkers, like uh, he mentions uh, Kusanas. Uh, and, I, and, and there were other people who were thinking integrally many, many centuries ago. And probably these people out in the, the deserts in Egypt, you know, these, the, this uh, Gnostic explosion that was happening pre-Christian probably, there were probably a lot of people who were tapping into these, um, these kinds of uh, fields yeah. force that were, were writing them. I think that, that's what I think about language. We're not, we don't write it. It writes us. We are the written. It's imprinting its uh, stamp on us with all these myths and stories and poems that if we open ourselves up and become sensitive to, they start coming through. So I, I, I think that's an old idea, but I think it's an idea that's going to serve us well as we, we, we negotiate what uh, moving from, I think, this uh, fragile mental structure, which is under stress and is probably regressing uh, to a very deficient form. And this uh, new capacity, this higher octave, as Gebs are said, which would not be, uh, which would be an, a fuller expression of all those previous stages, without privileging any of them. So anyway, that's my two cents. But can I tell one one brief story? I had a, I had a, briefly, I had a, a boyfriend, who was, who was deaf. He's um, he a deaf mute. He 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 was raised in Russia, and uh, he came to this country because his uh, family wanted him to have some opportunities that he wouldn't have there, as far as education was concerned. But what's interesting about our relationship was he could, he could read and write English, and I could read and write English. <laughs> so we always had paper with us, and we were all in a pen, and we were always writing things down. I would write something down, he would look at it, he would write something down. Um, but I, I did notice that, um, and I remember mentioning to him, I wrote down, what, what, what is life like for gay people in Russia? And he went, he, he, so that communicated something very deeply, you know. Um, and I remember when we, uh, we would be in a public place and, he, and there would be music playing and he would, he would touch, touch the bar and he's, he would vibrate and he, said he could feel it. And he would get up and start dancing with everybody else. But it was really interesting when the music stopped, everyone stopped dancing except for him. He kept dancing. <laughs> And, and when there was a problem, when he was out on the street and he would call me, uh, there would be a, a voice 
who would be interpreting, he would be texting something. This is before um, mobile phones. And there would be a translator who'd be communicating, but he was texting to her and she would be speaking in English to me. And very often it was very embarrassing for me because he would be communicating through her very intimate stuff about our sex life. (laughs) And so I was like astonished that he didn't get this, that some stranger was talking to me and he didn't. um, But these are the kind of experiences that taught me about um, adequate translation and how we're doing this. We do this with children. We do this as I have done with old elders who have dementia, who don't remember anything except they do they, their episodic memories there, but the autobiographical memory is gone. And we're, we're doing this with people who speak a different language and we're in a different country. Um, so I think these are, we have enormous capacities to mime and to uh, register affects and to sort of enter into the weave of another person, uh, pre-linguistically or translinguistically. So I think we, we, we need to start to thinking about adequate enough translations uh, between these unusual states of consciousness, perhaps. And I think enough of those adequate translations can actually create the conditions for a transformation. Um, but there's certainly no guarantee. It, it may not be a transformation. It could be a total breakdown. <clears throat> I think we see a lot of evidence uh, of that happening in our uh, environment and ecological collapse. It's what so many people are worrying about. But I agree, a compelling future actually is very helpful for creating a compelling present. Present, yeah. So I, I think we should start putting our energy into creating imaginatively in that fourth dimension um, certain uh, possibilities that we want actualized and then move towards that, Find implement uh, a plan to make that happen collectively. I think it's going to be very uh, challenging, but I think it's possible and desirable. And what do we got to lose? Exactly, and what do we have to gain as well? That's right. Quite a bit, actually. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying we communicate in nonverbal ways, and I think those nonverbals are extremely important. Um, and I think are often we're we don't, we're not aware of how communicative our nonverbals are um not just nonverbals but even just thoughts you know uh have you noticed an increase in the the number of times you think of somebody and you know the next thing you know they're calling you right um i i think uh Okay, so so this is this is Lisa's little theory about technology. Um, we tend, as humans, in order to understand something, we we project it out there and then we we play with it. Um, and so, uh, the internet, for example, you know, we all we we say we're we're all connected through the internet. Well, I think. The internet is actually something we've projected out there to understand our profound interconnectedness. Um, And that eventually we're going to realize, you know, we won't need to rely on things like, you know, Zoom um, to, to have those connections and maybe even, you know, to have these kinds of, of conversations. I don't know. But I, I think we need to learn and understand that what we're doing out there with computers and Internet and cell phones and, you know, all that sort of stuff, we have in here. We have that innately. And if we can develop those capacities – as well um perhaps a lot of the this this language stuff that i'm talking about is is actually going to become a moot point um we'll we'll get beyond the need to use these imprecise 
things uh, known as words to convey our um, our inner states, urges, desires, thoughts, um, all that stuff. But, you know, that's, that's way out. I, I'm not saying this is going to happen in the next, you know, 20 or 50 years. I, I don't know when it might happen, but um, it's just, you know, if I, if I can peer into my telescope uh, to the future and, you know, understanding the the integral consciousness in the way that Gabe sort of describes it, that it's all here all the time. Um, it, it's just a matter of, you know, which, which piece we want to engage at the moment. Well, so it's working itself out, right? And yeah. I think partly in response to Ed a bit earlier and the notion that, <clears throat> that we don't have to construct the, the language. We, moreover, it doesn't make sense. It's not actually how this is happening. It's more of a arising. It happens through us, etc. But I think there is a role for the struggle. Uh, and, you know, as a, as a writer, my, myself it's kind of the you know that that's the game is it, that's the yeah. essence of the craft is the struggle with language uh to get to to get into a relationship with it or to um uh there is a constructive aspect you know i mean even though things come phrases ideas insights whatever we still have to get them out and then we have to work with them uh, and that's a form of construction or a form of assemblage or a form of um, authorship right? where you really take a responsibility and you play a role of arranging concepts or telling a story or constructing a narrative or examining a concept or reconstructing a concept, etc. All those things are part of an agentic potential that, that, that we have and not only as individuals but as, as collectives as well. And there's a role in that, I think, in that larger meta process of what's happening on a cultural scale for the, the deep kind of plumbing, you know, with the, you know, the deep, the, the, the structures and the mechanics of the language itself. And so does that happen in English? Does it happen sort of at a meta level from English and other... Uh, tools we might have at our disposal, uh, other media we, we, we would also have. And of course, that is already happening. But then the question is, you know, from, from my perspective is, how am I relating to that? And what am I, you know, what, what, what am I reflecting? What's my facet doing, right? Um, th this is... A, I mean, this is a really interesting conversation because it's hard to have in the same way that speaking while you're aware of your tongue is, is hard. To pay attention <laughs> to your tongue while you're speaking is hard. And part of what we're doing here is trying, I think, meta-reflexively to pay attention to our language as we speak about the, the structure of language and how it, how it uh, uh, shapes our worlds, right? And part of what we're also talking about is how do we reshape our world? How do we reshape the, the reality that we live in, not presuming that we can do it, you know, unilaterally, but how are we participating in this self-reshaping that's happening where we still have an agentic kind of role to play? Uh, and that's concrete. Like you writing this paper is a concrete act. You, you, you spent time on it, spent time on it, um, and it came to us through certain networks, through certain relationships. It ties into I'm highlighting I'm emphasizing some of the inherent metaphors in what in what I'm saying um, it ties into other conversations that we've had you're building worlds as a, as an as a novelist Jeffrey I, I hadn't mentioned before is doing something similar 
I feel like I'm doing something similar in this sort of meta reflexive way with cosmos as a as a co-op it's a metaphor as much as it's a thing in the world uh and it's referring to itself because it's encom- it's encompassing or it's pointing to or it's becoming a vehicle for the whole and so all these things can mesh i think in some way or they are meshing in some way here but it's uh the only way we can sort of you know come to a uh to a com- we can become conversant with that process is through this sort of messiness of getting our yeah you know pieces out uh and seeing where they really like how they really uh relate to one another from the meta perspectives that we're able to take through that process of listening receiving this 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 dualness and so we're talking about something that's rel- it's it's it doesn't have a place so much in the utility function of the world. You know, like if you were to, like your water heater is a, it has to have an inside and outside. It, uh, it couldn't be a Klein bottle. Exactly. So the Klein bottle is a specialized sort of case to refer to, you know, some emergent, which um, has to relate to what already exists and to the more, you know, the topology of three dimensional reality, but then, bring in this fourth dimension and whatever is beyond that. that. Um, and so I mean, what I, <laughs> I know, I feel like this has been, been a sort of rambling uh, spaghetti uh, um, kind of sequence of thoughts, but um, the, there, there's a, um, we've talked a little bit about art and about, bringing sort of the conceptual work into a narrative cultural form, um, the struggle of working with language. I think we could add to that the possibilities of other media, other senses of embodiment. We have a certain interface right now. This Zoom call is a particular kind of interface that constrains our attention in certain ways, even affects the kind of language that we're able to, to use and perceive because we don't have access to all the embodied uh, communication that would otherwise be happening if we were in 3D physical space together. But what I'm, when we, part of what I think we could also be doing through that like envisioning of what the world is that we want to live in, what would be the world that we would recreate based on what we know, based on the full sweep of everything that uh, has arisen and happened in, in the cosmos <laughs> to, to date that we're aware of. Um, that has to be operationalized, right, in some ways. And it has to go from the, the, the Lincoln logs and the novels to, uh, to an external reality uh, or an internal external reality. It's, again, I'm, you know, I'm struggling right now with, with the words. And... Um, I, I've been trying to pay attention to how that oper- oper- operationalization happens in a way that sort of preserves the, the signification, you know, where the vehicle itself is like sign preserving, if that makes sense. Because, <laughs> I'm gonna, so, let, me, let me give this just one. Let me, let me see if I could just tie this in with a question, see if this question might, might be able to summarize what I'm, what I'm trying to think here. So this idea of a sign vehicle, that's one thing I got a little bit curious about because a vehicle is a metaphor and it presupposes kind of carrying of something from one location to another. A sign is something that points. So it's a way of signifying or it has a function of standing for pointing to. And both are happening at once. um, I think there might be sort of an entryway there or a, a um, an entryway there into thinking how things get operationalized, like how this work with language gets turned into uh, structures that we live in. Does that mean? So let me leave well, it there. As yeah, you, you, question you bring up there. some some really interesting points. Um, let me let me see if I can pull some thoughts together here. Um, okay, so so. One, when I was a little kid, I watched the Jetsons. I don't know if you guys, I know some of you were 
old enough there to watch. There was the Jetsons and the Flintstones. On, Sat- on Saturday morning. Yeah, Saturday yeah. Morning. yeah. Right, and the Jetsons had this TV phone. Right? We're doing that right now. It's been operationalized. Somebody thought of it, put it into a cartoon for little kids. Some little kid was, you know, so inspired um, that when all the technology that, you know, was necessary to make that happen, um, you know, wrote the program and now we're living the Jetsons. Um, So... You know, to the extent that, you know, my novel or your novel, Jeffrey, or um, Marco, to the extent that we can imagine things and put it down so that, you know, it might not take a whole generation, you know, uh, the way things are speeding up, um, it can can maybe be operationalized. in in other creative ways um so here's here's something else you marco you said about you know how can how can we live with these structures and um well i'm just going to show you a couple of of posters on my wall here from columbia uh, I was on a trip with um, John Perkins a couple of years ago, and we went and we visited um, this tribe in the uh, jungles of Colombia called the Kogi. Uh, you can find them on YouTube. There, there have been a couple of documentaries made about them. But one of the things that really struck me about the way they live is that they incorporate their their worldview into, so you go in one of their houses, you know, which are really just huts, and the roof structure has, you know, their, their rings going smaller and smaller into a, you know, a cone shape. And each one of those symbolizes a level of their world or their consciousness. Um, their weaving looms, uh, while they weave, um, they're, they're not just doing, you know, these rote actions of weaving. They are, um, the the loom itself represents the universe, the the four directions of the universe, and they are like the creators weaving together the warp and the weft of their world, and they are constantly being reminded, and I mean like literally, not just you know metaphorically by one of the, um, the spiritual leaders of the group called Amamo, um, that their, their weaving signifies the creating of their reality and the maintaining of their reality. Um, it's just, you know, I look at my house here and, you know, yeah, there's one, two, three, four, five beams going across the roof. They mean absolutely nothing. I am not reminded of, of my worldview by the structure that I live in. Um, you know, I, I, I might, you know, have to start building <laughs> houses that have a different structure um, to do that. Uh, and fortunately, here in California, we can have a kind of fluid in, inside, outside um, uh, kind of housing structure. Um, but I wouldn't do that in New York. <laughs> uh, so well, one last, one last um, point, uh, a, a story. Um, 
when, when did you all see the movie Avatar? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when Avatar came out, and I went online and started looking at the constructed language in it. I was really kind of disappointed because, you know, Avatar was this, you know, movie about our interconnectedness. And, and I wanted to see if the linguistic structure of the language reflected that interconnectedness. So, you know, I went on to the websites like learnnavi.org and, and found some dictionaries and grammars and things like that and was really quite disappointed um, that it just seemed to be a kind of mapping onto English um, sounds. And I, I wrote a, a kind of, you know, pointed blog post to Paul Frommer, the, the creator of, of Navi, um, saying, you know, hey, you know, dude, what's up? Come on. You know, we have this, this culture that's so interconnected. Why isn't the language reflecting that? You know, like, like borrow some ideas from Navajo or something. Um, and uh, last summer, I was at this um, language creation society conference. <laughs> I'm 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 the first one up. I'm first on the lineup to talk, and I look out into the audience, and there's Paul Frommer sitting there. And I'm <laughs> like, oh my god! <laughs> okay, but. Um, I, I went up to him during lunch one time and I said, you know, I owe you an apology. I, I wrote this really kind of critical piece about, you know, not V and, uh, and was able then to say, you know, here's what I have in mind. You know, I think it would be really cool if, and he said, well, you know, there's four more sequels coming out between now and 2025 and I'm thinking oh language can change these kinds of things can be introduced into Navi and you know what there are a pile of speakers of Navi out there um and so that's another type of operationalization that that can happen okay John, you look like you really have something to say. <laughs> oh, no, no, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just was going to respond. I'm done. Oh, okay, great. Um, in our little, um, in the session we did, uh, using clean language and modeling uh-huh. when, um, when I'm creating at my best, that's yeah. why, and you came up with a metaphor, and we were working with that metaphor, and I remember asking you in what environments, uh, when you're creating at your best, are there any environments that prevent you from creating at your best? And you made a sound. It was, I can't reproduce it, but it was, it went, hmm. And and then you gave a, yeah. And then you gave a verbal report. And then I asked you, and that, hmm, that sound you made, where does that sound come from? There was a long pause. And then you said, and then you gave a verbal report. It's from the sternum, up to the throat. And then I asked, um, I can't remember exactly what I asked after that, um, but you start talking about, um, you use the personal pronoun I. And I, I asked, and that personal pronoun I, what kind of I is that personal pronoun I that feels that joy from, it starts in the sternum and goes up to the throat? I'm sort of paraphrasing it. Uh, but what I'm offering here is that we can use language. Clean language is sort of a, 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 as a language about language, actually. I'm asking open-ended questions about the language that you are using, but mm-hmm. also the nonverbals. And, I'm run, I'm, and you spoke a lot about the, the, the father tongue and the mother tongue. And I think that um, I recall, I think, from Joseph Chilton Pierce, who wrote about the magical child. He says, in utero... We can study 
you know, uh, prenatal psychology now, and we can see the forming uh, embryo mm -hmm. responds to the mother's voice. And the physiology of the, of the emerging new life is, is, it's a whole body kind of experience to different diphthongs and more, you know, the morphemes and the phonemes and the diphthongs. And so when that um, baby uh, emerges from that uh, prenatal world, she's already programmed to speak the mother's tongue out of all the different language on the planet it's the the language that the mother is using that the baby is already prepared for um so that's i think very interesting and that hmm, that sound you made made from the body and uh another thing is that stereo uh that stereo uh, stereo effect that he um with the um where he's looking at the um I can't remember, the Klein bottle, you know, you look at one Klein bottle here, another Klein bottle there, but you look at it with your eyes crossed and a... And a oh, a yeah, Klein yeah, bottle. like the, a stereoscope. Yes, and he said you can, as you look at it, that third image that pops up out of those previous two with your eyes uh, out of focus, you can start to um, relax the eyes and go back into the middle of the head from where the eye, the conceptual eye, Mm -hmm. is located. And I disagree with him there. I don't think the eye is, is in the middle of the head. I think it's a whole body thing and you don't mm -hmm. need light to get there. And I think ants and bees and birds, they all have it. That, um, that concept I. But I think it, so I think that the personal pronoun I is much more than just what's happening in the visual system. I think the proprio and the kinesthetic are primary. Mm -hmm and the auditory and the kinesthetic and the proprioceptive working together creates the conditions for language to happen. But I think once we get into the language games, we sometimes uh, forget or have amnesia and we start to lose our, uh, the embodied sense of language and get wrapped up in more and more vapid abstractions, disconnected, the con concepts get disconnected from the perceptual field. So uh, my uh, goal in doing all this clean language stuff and symbolic modeling is to use language in a certain way um, that I think gets, uh, gets people much more embodied with their language. And I think more compelling language gains will start to emerge through that kind of uh, subtle kind of investigation. So thank you. Thank you for participating with me in that. I enjoyed well, it you, you know, we might end up creating whole body language exactly so well, i would deaf I, people already do that they do sign you know it has its own syntax so i was playing not with whole body but i was working with the little phonemes on this thing so i just share it with the little play, the little game that i was playing so i was thinking about when i have a facetime conversation with my best friend in montreal and when i call her i say oh hi how are you doing uh, and I might say, how am I doing? And, and so I was thinking about those kinds of statements. So I was saying, so instead of saying, how are you doing? How are you, I, ma doing? <laughs> so, how are you, but implicit I, so the relationship between the two of us. And the M, ma doing, is mundus, so the world. So it's how are you, I, ma doing, doing in the world? And then I had M everywhere. And then I thought, well, M any, everywhere isn't going to work because if you have M everywhere, everybody's just going to drop the M. So you have to have something else going on. So the other one could be, how are you, I, je doing? And the je means the, I'm in Quebec. So French, the yeah. is, is the I, intimate I. And so it's the world, the interior world, as opposed to the exterior world. So if I say, how are you, I, am doing, I'm asking, how are you doing in relation to the external world? And if I ask, how are you, I, je, doing, I'm asking how you're doing in relation to the internal world. So it's a way of playing with just small modifications to the language, um, you know, just a beginning playing with this idea, but... Uh, 
think it, I think there's something could be done more with it, you know? Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly what these conlangers are doing. They're they're playing in those sorts of ways. Um, I'd also like to mention it's interesting that you're talking about language because um I in my novels I have a a sort of future invented a lot of vocabulary that I've invented but not a language per se. But um I've just been working in fact I posted last night on our writers uh, page a text that involves some um, language from a constructed language. It's not my language. It's a it's a language called Palawakani, which is a constructed language that was developed by the Tasmanian Aboriginal descendants to rebuild their Aboriginal language because in the Tasmanian genocide, it's not what we call it, but that's what it was. The the Aboriginals were wiped out in Tasmania, and their their language disappeared with the last of their speakers. So the current generation of Aboriginals have been reconstructing their language based on documented texts, and it's this language called Palawakani. And so I've been using and drawing on Palawakani in the writing of my science fiction to to infuse the science fiction with because it has a it has a link to the culture, but it is a language that has perhaps more of the properties that you're looking at, looking for, Lisa, than Navi, the way it was written. It, it is, it is it's, it's, you know, it's like the Aboriginal languages, they're very simple and they don't have a lot of, you know, time tense and things like that, but, um, but it still is a, a language with a certain sophistication to it. And, um, it does interesting things. Where I, I couldn't really talk about it more. I'm not a linguist, but uh, but I've been playing with it in the context of, uh, of constructing. Um, well, that's great. Yeah, um, the the conlanging community is really uh, interfaced with the language, um, the the community that's trying to preserve dying languages. Mm. Um, there, there are ways of learning, the, you know, ways that they've developed to learn conlangs. They're applying to um, teaching people their Aboriginal natlangs, natural languages. Yeah. It sounds like there's an ethical dimension too to this. I mean, in in, the, in this community that you're talking about, the con conlanguage people that actively or as hobbyists or even professionally are constructing languages um is that do you find that in general that it's something that people are doing with a sense of purpose or mission or you know to change the world type of thing which i think is part of what you're saying with with uh you know in, in the papers that i've read um or do you think it tends more towards hobbyism you know hobbyists and People who just enjoy it, you know, just for right, right now. I think it's more hobbyists, um, more people uh, that feel like they have to do it because they have to do it. You know, it's just like one of those things that they have to do. Like they, you know, they're they're the the nerdy kid that just loves languages. Or um, there's there's actually a really nice film that you can watch online for like a couple of bucks called um, Conlanging, the Art of Crafting Tongues. But the, the website is conlangingfilm.com. And you, you get to meet a whole range of people who have all kinds of different motivations for doing the, the conlanging. And you get to see the vast richness and creativity that these people have in making and dedication in making their languages. They're, they're really, it's really beautiful. The, the way you speak about it reminds me a little bit of, uh, you know, folks who get really into chicken breeding or dog shows <laughs> or something like we, with my wife and my daughters, we, we watch documentaries a lot of times and we'll end up watching that. There, there is actually one, I don't remember the name of it, but it is sort of the competitive chicken breeding, um, you know, world or association. And 
you know, people who invest their whole lives uh, oh, yeah. into breeding the perfect chickens that conform to, you know, these specifications uh, around what, uh, you know, how, how the beak has to be and all the details about the proportions and the colors and the textures of the chicken. Um, and there's so much creativity that goes into it. That's the amazing thing. And these people are such characters, like they really bring it to life. And I imagine like this con, la con language is, is kind of like that. Like you could have a, con a convention of con languagers where everyone is showcasing uh, the language that, that they've invented. And you can have small groups talking to each other and the kinds of costumes they might, you know, wear. <laughs> I mean, that is the world uh, essentially of, you know, co comics and um, you know, fictional other worlds where, where the language is a creative aspect of, of, mm -hmm. of the world. And I wonder if like, part of what is happening is, you know, in the way that we're losing uh, older languages, like the, there's such an inherent creativity in the movement of people into language and through language that we have to just start creating new ones anyway. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think the, the notion of operationalizing is, you know, ha is, uh, carries its own baggage uh, with it. And of course, this doesn't have to be operationalized at all. You know, the world doesn't have to be operate. A climb bottle is not operational exactly, right? Uh, right. Um, but there are, you know, definitely like ways where it becomes political and it becomes more of a matter of, you know, urgency. Uh, like certainly... I mean, the, the whole notion of um, political correctness, right? And thought police are, mm -hmm. are ways that we're trying to take a, we're trying to really rely on a constructivism with respect to language in order to re-engineer society. And that's just happening, you know, on a wide scale right now. Um, and, you know, and that's been going on, of course, through history. I mean, the yeah. can canonization of certain ideas, certain texts, certain discourses, the uh, creating of like what's acceptable and not acceptable speech. Uh, this is part, this is inherent to and intrinsic to, you know, how power structures and how social dynamics have evolved, right? To, to bring us to where we are now. So it's natural that we, um, you know, look to the language as kind of decentralized agents and try to figure out better, better ways of, of using it, right. From, from the ethical point of view, from the like political point of view. Um, so like, I mean, this, this, I, I, I'm, I know that I'm getting into another loop here uh, and I do want to tie this back, uh, but it, it does speak to this sort of like play work. Like what are we really doing? In a way, we're playing. In a way, we're working. Our work is a form of play, but a play is serious because it has real effects in the world. Uh, and it's fun to create languages and it's fun to explore fictional worlds, but then we, we have to come back into, you know, the water heater that needs to be fixed and yeah. that need to be paid and so forth. And so, you know, I... I, um, I I'm really, uh, I mean, I, I'm just glad that we're having this conversation because it sort of is another weave in a conversation that we've been having, Jeffrey, John, Ed, and a few others have been sort of developing almost the, you know, over time, over a number of months now, um, which I hope has both this play dimension as well as a, a serious dimension. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that this goes somewhere, you know, that your work goes somewhere, that it, it becomes a, a taken up into other conversations, taken up into other people's work. Take, it would be wonderful if the next Avatar movie, for example, was aware of your, of your you know, was working with you in some way. Uh, and um, I could imagine a whole number of other projects that, you know, brought together diverse ways of thinking and being uh, with respect to language that are also sort of stacking, multiplexing with other layers of, of reality, technolo technological, media, etc.
So I just want to make, you know, as we're sort of winding down, I, I would like to just make, make sure that sense, there's a sense of openness around, okay, where, is, where does this all go? Uh, and, you know, we're not just talking. We're also creating even, even now. And mm -hmm. so what are we creating? And, uh, you know, we're, <laughs> where does, where, where, what happens next, right? Oh. I think John may, may have an idea. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, what you were saying earlier, Lisa, uh, you know, we're using this technology. Um, can we use this technology ethically rather than get sucked into the nefarious projects of uh, outsiders who are trying to exploit us? I think this is why we're having this conversation here rather than on Facebook. Um, so I think that's a choice that we have made. Um, and I, But I also think we're already telepathic just to convey a sentence, a novel sentence that's never been said before, that's never been heard before, somehow I can figure it out because I can anticipate from what you've already said, what you might be saying. And um, so I think there's an element of everyday telepathy operating in the simplest kind of conversations. Um, and this is a marvel. Uh, I don't think anybody, this is a profound mystery, but I think that we can use language in ways that can touch, the mind can touch. And I think this is working out of a very different, this is when the subject object dichotomy starts to um, be put aside or modified in some way. And I think poetry does this, uh, anecdotes, metaphors, we're doing this all the time. Can we do it more consciously? I believe we can. Um, but I just want to point out something, what I think what's really, Something that somebody said about algorithms, this sort of draws on previous conversations that we've had also with Jordan Brown, the filmmaker who wrote a, who did, who did an interesting film on technology and how the 2D screen is shaping our social realities in some detrimental ways, he believes. Um, and, I'm, I, and my question is about 4D. I believe we're already, everyday life uh, is drawing upon 4D and 5D, but we tend to, um, have amnesia for it. And when we look at language, we sort of disappear into the, into the words on the page. Um, but, but there is, I think, a, a climbing way of thinking about this. Because um, when we were learning how to read and write, it was a very different kind of game because we got very absorbed in our, uh, our synesthesia, our overlapping uh, senses were, were very uh, lively. And, uh, and I think as adults, we sort of have amnesia for it and we lose it, but we can get it back. Um, but I'm just thinking I, the main danger here um, is about algorithms. And you mentioned something about uh, re-engineering. And I think that re-engineering metaphor is a really bad metaphor. I think we should drop it. <laughs> I'm just letting you know that really triggers me. Uh, very kinest my kinesthetic proprioceptive senses uh, bristle with indignation when people start talking about engineering human beings. Um, but I think this algorithmic, the algorithm does not achieve sophisticated levels of self-reflection. This is thinking about our previous conversations. How do these unfelt, unintuitive, non-conscious automisms work on us? Um, I think that's the ever-present danger that we're in as we use this technology. That's the shadow of this technology. But I don't think it's inevitable. I think that we can become more meta-reflexive um, and take on other perspectives as well. And I, I believe there is uh, that we can start uh, creating new kinds of language games. But I'm, I'm very concerned, though, that about a, a private language, if a private language is possible or even desirable, uh, it seems to me unlikely. Um, I think Wittgenstein said there's no private language. I don't know if he knows what he's talking about, but he also said if a lion could talk, he would not understand it. Um, so I'm just thinking that language comes out of mama, mama and baby. And uh, then daddy gets included too. And then the, the tribe. Um, but it's very relational. And I think that uh, it... It, words do touch us. The tone of mama's voice when she was happy with us, or daddy's voice, those tonalities 
orchestrate uh, our kinesthesias and our proprioceptive capacities. So I'm just hoping that we can create language that is attuned to those proprioceptive capacities. And because uh, I think our kinesthesias are very primary and are very atrophied right now. I think we're losing, um, losing contact because I think we're so hypnotized by all these algorithms. Anyway, that's my spiel. I hope this happens, something happens next in our next calls, uh, building upon this call and the previous calls that we can um, use effective ways. So thank you. I feel that, um, Lisa, that you brought, um, I think uh, what we're trying on the Cosmos site, you know, I mean, we've talked a bit between ourselves about this. It kind of uh, a poor man's revolution, <laughs> a poor person's revolution <laughs> activity. <laughs> and I think, I think that the language part that you brought forward is critically important to the whole. Uh, and I kind of feel that as a collective enterprise, if I might include myself in that within the cosmos, uh, Marco, that uh, we should place the language part of the problem front and center in, in the work that we're doing on the site and maintain the dialogue with Lisa uh, over time in order to feed the development of that within the site. That's my, my proposal in terms of going forward from the discussion today. Oh, I would, I would love to continue this discussion. I kind of feel like, you know, I've, I've met my tribe. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Part of the problem is just too much to say in, in a small amount of time. And, you know, in a a first conversation, uh, we have to get a lot of things out. Uh, But then we have to sort out like, okay, what is relevant? What's, what do we, bring forward what do we you know preserve what do we uh transmit uh and what maybe we compost you know what goes back into the soil uh choosing my words I'm trying to choose them carefully i use the word re-engineer purposefully because i think that you that is to what piss is me off that's why <laughs> well no because i think it is i think it is what is happening there there are people who are trying to engineer society and re-engineer. yes they are they so, sure so it's important to highlight um the metaphors that 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 are that we're trafficking in, yeah, and like part of what I try to do in my writing, to the extent that I have time to write, to don't <laughs> uh, much, is to play with even the the enemy's metaphors, if you will, um, to you know, to to be as inclusive as as possible because in that sort of process of digestion, of metabolization of, of language as a living, you know, as a system of systems that's speaking to us and that we're speaking, uh, we can, purify is not, is a tricky word, you know, because it could, it's a, but, but maybe metabolize, uh, maybe um, reimagine, maybe, uh, Operationalize is tricky. It's 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 you know Gebser spent half of that book just disclaiming this is not how I mean these words. This yeah. is not how you're you know half that book is is a disclaimer to a few key ideas that he was trying to introduce, and I can really relate to that because as a writer who struggles with language uh, and who almost can't utter a sentence without having. Um, you know, mass five footnotes to it. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a it, it's a process, right? And part of what you know we have to do is find out what actually works. What could we? Like, what are the good metaphors? What are the good stories? You know, what are the good memes? What are the good concepts? What what, what sort of good syntax that allows us to flow? Allows us to feel connected? Allows us to have this sense that John keeps pointing to of the proprioceptive sort of flow. flow. <laughs> I'm going to have to smear words like Jeffrey, but the, the flow through speech of, uh, of communication, especially in these 
you know, weird spaces where we're not really, we're embodied, but we're embodied through and in relationship with our screens and our, and the electrons that are flying, you know, through uh, all this, this gadgetry. So it's, it's, it's kind of, um, I didn't know I would be here 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was a kid watching the Jetsons, really, that was totally fantastical. I had no, I mean, I, I remember thinking how, you know, that, how cool would it be when I can do a video call with somebody? It was so exciting to me. Now, you know, this I really enjoy, but a lot of times video calls are work <laughs> and, you know, I'm doing it because I, I have to do it to get paid. And it's part of, part of, you know, making a living and, and it's become more used against me <laughs> than as, um, or it feels that way anyway, uh, than as a liberation. So go, you know, at, Part, what I would like to do is to rethink our infrastructure, to rethink our exostructure and our infrastructure, and to sort of rebuild it with the tools that we have available, which doesn't include $2 billion of financing, um, but does include Zoom and a forum and websites, etc. How can we use what we have access to, to start to kind of create spaces for ourselves in the sort of media architectonic sense. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't rebuild our, the house, um, but in the media our, our architecture and in our, our social praxis, pra- practices to give us the space to, ha- to sort of figure out what the real, you know, what language we really, really wants to come forth like what's the world that's being born, like what's the piece of it, the facet of it that that we're bringing to light. Uh, so I really welcome this conversation about language. I think it relates very directly also to things like, you know, if you're starting an organization, how do you constitute it? Like, how do you literally give it a, an inner form? That happens in language. And if we want to really give it a, a form that can be a vehicle, a form that can signify the whole, then we really have to pay attention to the language that we, we use there. And, and what is coming through? What's flowing through uh, in those those structures? And I feel John. Yeah, I believe that future organizations of the future. Yeah, and building in, in building in balancing. Well, I, I believe that the future. This is my compelling future for organizations. Every member of the organization, their metaphor, their own metaphor is in the mix. Each of us has our own metaphor and we can put it on the table and it's included. Right now we just have a few bosses, few executives, their metaphors are the ones that re-engineer everybody. So I, so this is what I wanna move towards. It's like, let's make those metaphors explicit. It's not easy to do that. Sometimes these metaphorical constructs are quite hidden. And if there's trauma involved, it takes a while before we can reconnect to our voice in, an effective, in a way that communicates effectively. And that can touch others. So I think that's a big challenge. But I think it's definitely desirable. It's possible. Mm. I think we have every, everything that we need. We may not know that consciously, but I think we can uh, strive to move in that direction. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I hear, here. So we're online. Um, our forum, Lisa, please continue. Yeah, uh, I will. I will. Um, I'm sure we'll all have new ideas that we can circulate to our group. Uh, and maybe next week we can think of another project or future projects that uh, we could all sign up for. Yeah, just having these conversations is so valuable. Um, it, uh, you know, it, the, the vibrations get reinforced. Right. Yeah. They get amplified. Amplified. Yeah. And they get stronger in between these online sessions. What mm-hmm. happens during the week and the activities of the week, some of it is still vibrating for me. And I think that's what bring, keeps bringing me back. 
I want to amplify that even more. We're all slow thinkers here. <laughs> we have fast sides to us, but we are slow thinkers. <laughs> <laughs> and slow is good. Slow is strong and powerful and deep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you need slow and fast. That's right. So, uh, what's I mean, next? Like, Who's yeah, next? I mean, just, uh, we don't have a topic for next week. I mean, this is fairly autopoetic or symbiopoetic. Uh, my commitment is to show up. Uh, if uh, t- weekly uh, on t- Tuesdays at this same time, and I have other commitments as well. We have a journal. Uh, metapsychosis. We're working on a blogging platform, podcasts, I mean, a whole sh- array, a smorgasbord of of ec- projects. Many of them are sort of latent and half formed and in process and in development. Um, and you know, as as for the whole cooperative idea and structure, that's also it's fairly thought out, but it, it's not yet operationalized. It's part of why it's on my mind. But what's next is really what we each bring to it, and so. Uh, part of the idea of just doing these Cosmos cafes is having a, a regular space or a ritual type space where uh, if John wants to bring something forth or Ed wants to bring something forth or, or we, bring, we invite a guest, as John invited you. Uh, previously, I uh, had been contacted by a filmmaker that John mentioned, Jordan Brown, uh, who had done a documentary about screen culture and the way screens affect consciousness and how, how screens also are affected by power structures um and it's a it's iterating and uh and unfolding uh so really like i i would love to publish your work i mean this piece transforming language to transform the world it's sort of a summary of it seems like a summary of themes that come up in the longer emergent language of paradox and in uh some of the stuff on your blog which i only skimmed uh looks like there's interesting stuff there but you'll but also from a few years ago, you haven't published that much lately. Yeah, no, uh, I've been I've been really busy with my day job lately, mm. so I haven't had as much time to devote to the blog. Mm. But there there are a couple of um, uh, talks, you know, like the talk that I gave to the language creation conference. Um, those those are the newer stuff that that's up on the blog. Mm. Um, anyway, and yeah. there's there's a little more variety, you know, like there's some poetry there, and it's it's not all expository writing. I like poetry. Um, yeah, so really, you're just welcome to hang out. Hang out, uh, great. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> we, we do. We have a writing group as well. Just started that Jeffrey mentioned, and uh, you mentioned spheres. We're we're, uh, we're reading a book or a trilogy of books uh, called Spears by the uh, by Peter Sloterdijk. Uh-huh. And he's really exploring t- a sort of topology and a sort of metaphysics or topological metaphysics, the, the, the ways in which the, the basic oh, shape that we're going to Yeah, you, you, you uh, the, there's some, this has been an ongoing discussion, but looking at the bit, the sphere versus the climb bottle versus other sorts of, you know, shapes has been part of what we've also been playing with yeah. and, uh, and the Taurus the Taurus of course mm-hmm. there's an epic thread on donut, a proposed donatology yeah. which is sort of a, a toroidal <laughs> metaphysics uh, so you may have found your tribe and just saying you know stop, uh, most of the actions on the forum so if there's going to be something happening it will be posted there and uh, we do have an email list. I just don't send to it very often because it's a bit more cumbersome than just posting on the forum. Uh, mm-hmm. And as we get more operationalized, communication will improve. And you record these. We yeah, this so on YouTube, so you yeah, can so, review um, a video. Yeah, and I, I agree, Marco, that we will need to think through what we've talked about today and figure out, you know, how we integrate this within the larger project. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we need an integration phase. I think some. My feeling is we. These are so exciting. These uh, calls, but I sometimes, what did we learn? I'm. I'm a little. 
I'm a little bit uh, fuzzy about that. Um, so that we can integrate these calls. And I know, who wrote the minor gesture, Jeffrey? Erin Manning, yeah. Oh, I think she's wonderful. Yeah, so I'd like I, to ask her if she'll come and introduce uh, the discussion. So I'm waiting for her reply on that, so. Yeah, if she can, that would be great. If not, we could still uh, yeah, we can just find a reading. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think that would be a, another future episode yeah. that would be very interesting. And I'm thinking of something that I would like to present as well. Something on the per, on um, on pronouns. I have to say, um, I mean, you guys talk the integral story a lot, but I really don't know quite what that's about. I've never had it actually spelled out for me. I, I remember I was having a conversation with a colleague of mine, and he was sort of saying, "Well, what is the integral?" and I. I don't know. I didn't get it out right because <laughs> they didn't get anything out of it. <laughs> so obviously, Marco, I, I missed Marco wrote a book on it. <laughs> so I would be interested to have a discussion at some point about. Okay. Well, I can ask John. John has um, my my John here has uh, done a lot of work with Gabeser and the integral and trying to. Get a, is that around that? I mean, I admit I haven't read Gebser. I mean, that's uh, all of these people have, and I came in later than I joined the site after they'd read Gebser. So I have the book on my pile of reading, but we have so much reading in the yeah, and it's a big one to read. So <laughs> well, 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 John's good at explaining it in you know in everyday language to make it comprehensible. I don't know if Marco wants to mention that he wrote a book on this with Terry Patton. Um, oh. It's Wilbur's version of, of the integral. And I think Gebser is another major thinker who uses that integral as well, or apperspectable. I think um, Marco's an expert. I may, he may have evolved beyond all that, but I think he'd be an excellent person to consult, Jeffrey. I, uh, I moved to Colorado in 2003 to... Um, get involved with Integral Institute, which was founded by Ken Wilbur. And so I moved out here as a fan, as a you know, would-be student, devotee, whatever. I was really just taken by that, by his philosophy uh, and ended up working with him and, you know, in this startup type of organization from 2003 to 2007. At the, and at the end of which, I, be, I co-authored or became a co-author with, as John mentioned, Terry Patton, Adam Leonard, and then uh, Wilbur on a book called Integral Life Practice, which is more of a sort of manual around body, mind, spirit um, exercises or practices or ways of de self-development. I did, though, grow beyond it. Um, and partly because Wilbur's approach is Although, although he, I think, uh, has, you know, he's a, in many ways a very integrated mind and person, in other ways not so much. And one of the ways is that you know his model became more and more mentalized in a way, uh, over mm -hmm. over time, less in less poetic, actually, uh, and and then really kind of sort of geared towards or became geared towards a certain kind of set of uses in business and for coaching and for things like that. And I think less conducive toward the more, the richer spiritual types of work that you find, I think, through through Gebser. Um, Aurobindo would be another example. We're, we're going to be uh, reading Aurobindo this, this summer, The Life Divine. Uh, and so, but Wilbur is one, I think, important st strand and expression of, of, of integrality. And, and so, yes, I do too. So there, and there is a story there, you know, there is, a, when some people talk about integral, they mean Wilbur. Uh, when other people talk, talk about integral, they mean Gebser. Uh, other people in other contexts would be really referring to an integral yoga or to, in Spanish, it would be whole wheat bread, pan integral. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, so th there are there are sort of like layer there are stories within stories around what integral is, 
And we're making it up as we go along. Yeah. We're, we're improving here. That's yeah. right. I mean, part, part of the idea, part of my impulse is sort of a space, a trans integral. I, I wouldn't even call it that because, I mean, much like you point out, even like the language that you use to talk about being may kind of negate being in the fact that you have to hyphenate it and do all these kind of weird things with, yeah. the, with the language. So I tend not even to talk about integral myself because I almost can't do it without it referring to some limited context where I want to speak more about the holistic context. And well, maybe we, it's Marco. I think we need to hear not, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. I'm just saying that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I would like to, since you're in Colorado, um, the next Gamester conference is going to be in Boulder, I want to say. I think um, that's right. Yeah. Naropa at Naropa Institute. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, I heard rumors of this, but I haven't seen anything official. And Bo it's 15 minutes down the, down the, down the road from me. Oh, that's fabulous. Fine. Yeah. my John is um, helping to... Um, organize it he's oh. he's helping to like get the the theme and the papers and the submissions and you know all of that stuff done so we'll definitely be there awesome so when is it uh, uh it's in october john do you know when 12th and 14th. the 12th through the 14th of october this year uh, okay. and then now this is this is not written in stone yet but um, early in 2019, um, John wants to have a Jung plus Gabeser conference here in Monterey, where wow. we look at this, the, the, you know, resonances between Carl Jung and Jean Gabeser. Oh, that sounds interesting. I've read Jung. I haven't read Gabeser. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, one out of two ain't bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and if you have friends who read Gebser, that's the second best thing. Well, by then, friends. I might have read some Gebser too. So. <laughs> yeah, because we're both really involved in our local Monterey Friends of C.G. Jung group, which which meets you know like this one, but we meet in person once a week here. Oh, cool. It's wonderful. So, that, so uh, if anybody uh, comes out to Boulder, the Colorado area, then let's, let's definitely get together. Maybe that's great. Another area that I have questions about is the relationship between Jung and all the stuff that we're doing, because it's it's uh, another connection that is kind of implicitly there, but never seems to come to the fore, but is always in the background, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. for me, because I've read Jung, so... Um, Well, maybe you can talk about that. We, we, did, did Ed have to leave? I didn't see. Ed didn't yeah. see. Yeah. yeah. I, I missed yeah. He got, he got some your chat message. Oh, okay. All right. Well, perhaps we should wrap it up. We, we usually go a couple hours. Uh, and so we've done that. And... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, by this time, I, I need to get it back to uh, average everydayness. Um, <laughs> back into, uh, you know, three-dimensional structures. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> it's been great spending some time with you, Lisa, and uh, getting to know you a bit. It was really interesting and, and great reading. Keep up the good work. And well, thank you. You'll be in, in touch. Uh, the the more you can be involved, the better it is for us. So, <laughs> well, and for me, yeah. So as I, you know, I I am working on another book. So as it starts to morph into something, um, you know, it's still up in the ethers yet. But mm -hmm. as as it comes down into manifestation, um, you know, I'll I'll need uh, a, an honest feedback group. We're good so, at that. Yes, we like that. I think you guys, you, yeah. <laughs> and just so all right. Well, thank you, thank you so much for inviting me to join. I really am uh, thrilled 
Um, I look forward to more conversations um, and hearing what you guys are up to. Uh, I'm, yeah, found my tribe. <laughs> cool. Just before you go, the first book is the, the one that is both. Is that what it's called? That's my novel, yeah. Okay. That's the first book. Okay, beautiful. Do you I'd need one? I can yeah. send you. <laughs> I'd love to see it, sure. Okay. Have, yeah. My copy is around here somewhere. Well, I feel like I've heard that phrase before. I read it before. And I wonder if I, I wonder if it, it's your, that your book came up in another conversation. And I didn't it, know it probably it. has. I think I've mentioned it a few times. Okay, so. that might be it. But yeah, well, I, I bought it off Kindle, so um, uh, it's, it's on my list. <laughs> great. It's a fun read. It's a lot of fun, and it's also very educational. It's great. Nice. Okay. Well, thank you, Lisa. Okay. You, John, Jeffrey. Good night. Have, have a great week, everyone. Bye bye. See you next time. Okay. See you Thursday, you guys. <laughs> yes, Thursday for Saturday, for sure. See you all again. <laughs>